It's been a phenomenal experience. Yeah. From the moment you and I spoke yeah. and the entire journey getting here, immaculate. So thank you and the Binance team, awesome. Uh, and I, I've been surrounded by so many smart people and I've learned so much. Actually, my head hurts a little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, that's saying something. Coming from such, such, uh, such a Web 2 pioneer as you into Web 3, could yeah. you, um, just for those watching at home that might be, you know, new to crypto, new to, you know, your background, could you just give a quick kind of overview of your journey? Yeah, <laughs> it's been a journey. Yeah. So I grew up in England, you might have guessed from my accent, and I was making music videos, and then I met a guy called Sam Hauser, who is president of Rockstar Games, and he was working on a game called Grand Theft Auto 1, and I couldn't believe that I could get a job making a game like that. Uh, and so I joined um, as a producer, and then before I know it, we've been acquired by Take Two, and I'm out in New York, and uh, we created the Rockstar label. And I was very lucky, and I worked on one, two, three, Vice, San Andreas, Bully, Warriors, Midnight Club, all of it. Just so let's just rewind for a minute. So you, you know, when you when you get pulled into GTA One, yeah, what was the um, what was the, the the route in there? What were you doing, and, and how long was it before it started to really get traction? Because everyone remembers that GTA top One down. from the, the top down, yes. yeah, bird's eye yeah. view, and then. You know, there was that discussion about, oh, it'd be amazing if this was sort of 3D, and then it did go. So it had great traction in Europe mm. when it was top down. And so I was making music videos, and one of my clients said, I really need you to meet this guy called Sam. And she said to Sam, you really need to meet this producer called Jamie. And I turn up, and we were, I just, we clicked. I totally understood where he was coming from. And I'd also not played anything like it. I'm running around, and there's that Harry Krishna's yeah. Gallagher bonus yeah. round stuff. And I looked, I was like, I'm in. Just. So at first, I was an independent producer, and I had my little laptop and my little portable printer, and I did the TV ads for Grand Theft Auto 1. And I was probably helping test, because it was at that stage. And they were making Silicon Valley, Monkey Hero, and then we had a three lines official football game. And so I had to do like a launch party, and we had a band called Ocean Color Scene play live, and we had footballers and the whole thing. And I think then at that point, I proved myself and I got given a full-time job. And that was at BMG Interactive. And I don't know why, but they decided to sell the Interactive division just before, or just as Grand Theft Auto 1 came out. And so Take Two, an American publisher, picked us up. And then very quickly, they're in New York. Sam said, I've got to go, and I've got to take a couple of people. Do you want to come? So that's how I went there. And in New York, there were a very small group of us. We had some Americans that we brought into the fold. There was people from Acclaim um, and sort of locals, and, but a very small group, and we made GTA 2. So we did all of it and with the testers, and it was really interesting with GTA 2 where we were still top down because it's still PlayStation 1, if I remember correctly. And we tried things like the gangometer and the idea of the concepts of consequences to your behavior. Mm. So early on, if you do something over here, there's going to be a consequence over there. And again, so it's been a long time, but if memory serves me correctly, it was the PlayStation 2, which had the vector units, and it was the, the uh, sort of going back to assembly code, like low-level physical computations. It was like, ooh. We tried with the Dreamcast, couldn't quite do it. It was like 2.5 3D. And we did know well, we did firmly believe that in 3D, America and everyone would understand, it'd be easier to digest actually what's being given to you from a tone and a sensibility and a discourse on society and life, and then the freedom of, I'm just gonna run around and punch strangers, shoot strangers, nick a car, smash it, abandon it, run away from police and start all over again. And so it was wonderful when 3 did have that success. We didn't really dwell on it because as soon as it came out, we had a year to make Vice City and we helped Remedy uh, finish Max Payne. So we were just seven days a week. And we sort of, in no way did we rest on our laurels. I mean, once it sort of got to Vice City, you know, I think it was the attention to detail with not just, you know, the, the consequences, what would happen, 
um, the, 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 the scope of the game, but it was the, the minutia of being in, in the car and having the radio and the comedy of the adverts. That was phenomenal. And the multiple stations yeah. with the multiple adverts and different, you know, that, that would change regionally. I mean, you know, that must have been a huge job in itself to it get all of that recorded. It was a huge job. And I, so back then, so we're the publisher in New York, and DMA and what became Rockstar North, the developers. Back then, there was a, a very strong discourse of us and them between publishers and developers. And there was the notion that a lot of the publishers came from sort of packaged good companies and didn't appreciate actually the creative talent and the programming and the hard work that went into these games and would often make bad decisions. And so then the, all the better developers sneered at publishers, didn't like them. And I'll always love and respect Sam Hauser for this because he said, listen, the devs are the talent. We have to work twice as hard as producers to prove it and earn ourselves. Saying that, we had grown up on American culture, American movies, American music. We cared about fashion and architecture and music. And so what we could do was bring all the cultural references. So for example, I, fa we, I found the weapons specialist and they were local and they had all the weapons and an amazing room. And that room is actually featured in the Grand Theft Auto 2 intro movie, which was also shot in the hallway of where we worked. We were all in it. And we would then bring the developers over, have cars, drivers, cameras, memory sticks, and locals to be like, these are the spots in Brooklyn. These are the spots in the Bronx. These are in Harlem. And so they could understand the cultural references mm. of why landmarks were important. Mm. So we sort of brought all of, let's say, the filmmaking. So we built out the mocap in the first one. It's us lot doing the head button, the punches, and the <laughs> knees. But we were very, sort of determined to really prove our worth as a publisher and help provide all the cultural references, do all the research. Dan Howes is an amazing writer. James Worrell, an amazing writer. Uh, Laszlo, who just, the whole radio stations. And of course, because we're in Brits in New York, it's like Candyland. And just the, the amount, America's culture is the biggest export. And it's just so deep and all the the late night cable shows and you know the Teddy Evangelists and these, um, uh, there's so many characters. And, then, and Lazo, I think, really helped bring that dynamic to the radio station. How did you, the music was such a big part of the game as yes. well. Like how did you yeah. get the licensing? I mean, that must have been- you That know, was a even, journey. Yeah, I bet it was. That how, was a journey. How difficult was that journey with getting the licensing? So it was a lot of, it was a lot of work and effort and there were a number of people involved. And for Vice, that was more Terry. Did it, because the cost implications can be astronomical. They and, can, and so we're, we were very good and we negotiated, a, a, we had to, because we had so many. So obviously you do, you know, 50 sync and 50 masters, like it's split. And I think there, I'm sure there are plenty of artists who feel like they should have got more, and I get that. Same time, we had the scale and, the volume, and it was just one piece of the Grand Theft Auto experience. So that definitely was a challenge. My experience with music clearance was on San Andreas. Mm. And there were some very critical hip hop tracks. They just kept saying no to everybody. And so sometimes when there was a situation of, there was a blockage, they'd ask me to go in and deal with it. And it took me six months of negotiating with Capitol Records and a sub label and building relationships and building the trust. And in order to, there were six songs and to get one, in order to get those six, we compromised. And you may not notice this, but there's nothing in the manuals that shouldn't be there. Mm. And in San Andreas manual, there is a half page advert for a Cameron song that was not to that period. <laughs> and that was the compromise. <laughs> right. And six months of negotiating. <laughs> and it was for the easy E and like it was like a really important song. So that was sort of my sort of personal. And then there were certain artists that I tried really hard to clear. A Nirvana, Red Hot Chili, and just couldn't get none of us. We we uh, we tried everything. Yeah, yeah. We hated a no. It was a <laughs> a huge failure. We were meant to be it was a able challenge. to do anything. A no was a challenge. Absolutely, because yeah. we constantly felt we were making art. We were very determined on a mission to prove to the world this, that games could be for grown-ups. That this was a, a superior form of entertainment that was amazing. And I just, and that the games could be more than just, 
fantasy or you know casual just yeah i'm not doing very good work well work, no 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 you reinvented the genre and so we were kind of on a culture we culturally innovated i don't know if we consciously sort of articulated that at the time but it was we were on a mission because also vice san andreas hot coffee american mums lobbyists groups you are the, the the devil you should be taken out in the street and stoned to death you're the worst you're ruining the moral fiber and fabric of of future generations and on our side of course freedom of speech but no this is a very articulate intelligent creative offering sure you're getting out guilty pleasures playing a video game but it doesn't actually generate antisocial behavior since the uh, you know those heady days of the early the early releases of uh, of GTA yeah. and subsequent games blockchain and web3 has come along yes now the uh, the interesting thing with the gaming side of things you know I've, I have a 12 year old son he plays Fortnite he asks for money I buy the skins yeah. there's no ownership none and that that money has got that that money is Renting. gone but yeah. the 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 promise and the ability of of web3 to deliver real world value within the games in game economies what was your take when sort of crypto and web3 came along in terms of what could happen what the potential was or is i think it's fair to say that the potential of true ownership interoperability the idea of a player centric economy that really appealed to me no so many people don't really appreciate that oh i bought my game on steam but actually no what i've done is i've paid for a license and at actually any point that can be taken away and there is this appetite for i'm going to give you all of my attention and time and i'm going to spend money and i've got nothing to show for it in the grand scheme of things i've spent i like to grind but I have spent money in League of Legends. Love League of Legends. I have spent money Clash Royale. Played it for 10 years. So, but, I, but it's all just gone. I can't do anything with it. And then, so the interesting the idea of, well, how do, to your, playing with your child and how, how do you share, transfer that as if you'd invested in a barrel of whiskey or something. Like, so, and, but it, so that definitely appealed to me. And I think it was more the idea of, Making games is really hard. And so you're now trying to make games on a completely brand new tech stack that he hasn't even built yet. Wild. Like, how hard? And so I was fascinated by the innovation, and there's a freshness and an excitement in the community where I feel there's a lot of there's elements of the Web2 gaming industry I don't love, and it's non innovating, and it's crunch and grind. I just don't like a lot of the facets. So there was a lot happening in the Web3 community where it's young, it's fresh, a lot of collaboration, it's very exciting, and it's completely unknown, and there's no template. And yes, that's terrifying, but that's also what makes it really exciting. Um, in terms of the, um, the ability for communities, so gaming communities, to become part of the process, let's talk about like governance, for example. Mm -hmm where you've got crypto and web3 where the the community is part of the say of how a, de a project develops and when you apply that to gaming what's the potential between the relationship between the players and the studios and developers that are making the games well it's completely different because now i'm a shareholder i'm a stakeholder stakeholder yeah. i'm participating in the governance and the economic direction and policies as a studio okay I'm circumventing traditional channels I now have this community that are online 24 7 and all and are, and are very hungry for information and are very impatient when you don't deliver so it's a whole thing but yes the idea that now I have spent however many years playing League of Legends Ten years playing that, that I could actually have a bit more involvement from a governance perspective, and that I can now also own. There's a ref, there's a tangible evidence of my input of attention and time and effort and money, and I have it and I can trade it so I can actually benefit financially from it, or I can grow it again 
and benefit financially from it. So I think it's, it's really powerful. That connection hasn't crossed over yet into mainstream gamers. It's part of what I'll talk about on the panel. I think it will come. Mm. It's starting. Mm. I think we really need to sort of, that there's issues of trust, really showing the value of governance and interoperability, which is a whole thing. But those sort of shining beacons of why this is the future will be very sort of part and parcel of helping the sort of mainstream Web2 gamer, call it, get involved. Mm -hmm. Have there been any releases that you've seen where you have gone, oh, that's, that's interesting with regards to kind of Web3 releases? I mean, there was the Off the Grid. We're all excited recently. about Off the Grid. Yeah. It is not a silver wand, but it is pushing everything forward. Mm -hmm. So I'm personally very excited sorry, about The Wanderers mm -hmm. as a game. And I fell in love with the project and the founders late last summer and I advise them. They, it's the roguelike genre and they're taking bullet hell and they're mashing it up with deck building and theory crafting. And so, so they're innovating the gameplay. They're also now free to play on the Epic Store sort of at the, fore, at the coal face of how do we broaden our distribution reach? How do we be on these traditional Web2 gaming distribution centers? How do we balance the free to play uh, and models in a traditional gamer, how do we, you know, abstract and just completely sort of to the background the concept of wallets and gas fees and all, just come and give us, and yeah, there's a wallet if you need it, don't worry about it, if you want to spend money. But then actually there is this whole thing on chain where there's NFTs and they have value and, um, they, and they just signed a deal with Treasure, which is fab. So that I'm very excited about. Medicaid is another project that I've been working on and they're more focused on sort of Web3, helping Web3 game distribution. Right now, they're sort of really the home of game utility on base. Personally, I've not been very involved at a governance level. I've, I think it's amazing. I, I go into a private Discord and I join a town hall and I have to find out if my proposal is validated or not. And it's wild dealing with DAOs and, and that whole process. But yeah, so I, I've not been deep on a particular day. But it's great. And it's, but it's, I love the whole concept of it. And because also, well, traditional gaming, the publishers, they did so well with the rise of live streaming platforms and the fact that I can now self-publish because so many of the community were now creating content, were doing marketing for them six months into their project. And at first they're like, oh, but actually no, they're crowdsourcing your marketing. Hello. <laughs> and then at the same time with, you know, they, they've sort of realized the same with crowdsourcing development. So I love this company, like me and the Wanderers. Oh, and I'm just such a fanboy. And how do I give you my time? And how, so I'm giving you my time, my effort, my passion, my money. Why shouldn't I then actually have a, a reap the rewards or, or be participating in a way where I can say I don't agree and feel like I've got to say and feel like I'm helping steer the ship. And then because of all of my effort, actually benefit from that beyond just that warm cozy feeling in your heart 